Hello, and welcome to Legally Speaking, a production of the Macomb County Bar Foundation. Some have said that the election of 2018 was the year of the woman. In fact, Michigan voters elected overwhelmingly female candidates. For the first time in history, the top three executive positions are going to be filled by women, the governor, the secretary of state, and the attorney general. In addition, two women were elected to the Michigan Supreme Court. Today, we'll be talking to the three women on the Michigan Supreme Court and how this impacts all Michiganders. Welcome to Legally Speaking. I'm Ashley Lowe, the Chief Executive Officer of Lakeshore Legal Aid. Lakeshore is a nonprofit legal aid program that provides free legal services to low-income people, survivors of domestic violence, and seniors throughout Michigan. I'm so honored today to be here with the three women on the Michigan Supreme Court and to talk about the success in women's, of women in the elections uh, in 2018. Welcome to all of you. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks. I'm joined today by Justice Bridget Mary McCormick, uh, Justice Elizabeth Clement, and Justice-elect Megan Cavanaugh. Thank, Thank you so much for, for joining me today. I'm hoping you can start by talking a little bit about your background and the path that you took to the Supreme Court. Thank you. For, first of all, thanks for having, uh, having us. We're excited to be here and I think excited to be here together. Um, uh, I've been on the court since January 2013 and have always had one female colleague and for the first time uh, in my judicial career I will have two and I'm very excited about that. Um, I had, a, I had a, a unique path to the Supreme Court court, although so have my colleagues here, and um, um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to hear, hear from them as well. But I was on the faculty at the University of Michigan Law School um, when I was elected to the court. I was the uh, associate dean for clinical affairs, and I ran a number of clinical programs at the law school where my students and I represented clients in uh, the state courts as well as the federal courts, including the Michigan Supreme Court. So I was a, a, a lawyer in that court, but I was not previously a judge when I was elected. Um, my path is, is also unique, which I think um, helps make our court so diverse and um, is what is so exciting about it. I, I started in family law and then went to work in the legislature as an attorney and then for the governor as an attorney. Um, so I, I feel um, you know, my background is, is in public service in a, in a little different way, um, and I bring a true appreciation for the separation of powers and the role of the judiciary um, and knowing how a state government works um, and also a passion for, for family issues. Hey, thanks. Justice Kavanaugh? Hi. Uh, so I have, uh, I also have uh, never been a judge before, but I, um, I've been an appellate practitioner. I've worked uh, in the Supreme Court, practice in the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals uh, for about 16 years. Um, so I have that offer the perspective from the other side of the bench and have worked <coughs> um, in leadership positions with the State Bar um, of working with, with the courts, various courts of, of all sort of trying to make the, the justice system work better. So I think it's fair to say that most people don't know a lot about the function and the importance of the Michigan Supreme Court. Um, only about a third of voters make it all the way down to the end of the ballot where we have the nonpartisan positions and elect judges. Um, although that was not quite as true in this past election, uh, it's still true that most people don't vote for Supreme Court justices. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the importance of the Supreme Court and why that matters to all of us? The Supreme Court uh, is known probably to most people for our, uh, the decisions we make. That's, that's what most people think we do, and it's obviously a really important part of what we do because we, make, we are the, the final decision maker in um, every legal question that affects Michigan citizens. So that's a big part of our job, making those decisions and sometimes figuring out which of those decisions we have to make. We actually get to choose which cases we decide. But the Supreme Court has another important function, and that's um, we are charged by the Constitution with administering the courts of the state. And that means we run a really big administrative operation. And that, frankly, is probably where we have the ability to have the most impact, because most people who interact with courts in this state are interacting with our trial courts. Their, their, their cases are not going to the Supreme Court. 
Um, but it, it matters how they can get their business done in the trial court. And we, we actually know from extensive public opinion surveys that the National Center for State Courts does that people care a lot about courts that are independent and transparent, that they are engaged with the community, and that they are places where they can get their business done effectively and efficiently. Um, and I think I let uh, my colleague Justice Clement talk a little bit about some of those administrative duties because she's incredibly uh, active in them and, um, and, and we're excited to have uh, Justice Kavanaugh help us. So um, an interesting part of, of what we do is each justice has liaison roles um, to help with the administration and access to justice for all of our, all of our courts. Um, I'm assigned to our problem-solving courts, which involve drug courts, mental health courts, our veteran treatment courts, and sobriety courts, as well as child welfare issues, so our, our foster care system. Um, and it's, those are two areas that I'm, I'm very passionate about and really have an impact on our communities. Um, with our problem-solving courts, a lot of times people are interacting with the criminal justice system and they have an underlying issue that if we just put them through the criminal justice system and, and, and probation and they don't get treatment and assistance with that underlying issue, what we see is that they keep coming back um, to the criminal justice system, which is costly, um, not only um, through, the, through the court system, but also with our jails and in prisons. Um, but it's also um, not beneficial to our communities to, to have continued, to continued crime. Um, so these problem-solving courts are incredibly successful. We track all of the data and have for over 15 years, and we know that they're successful. We know that we have increased employment and a, a decrease in recidivism. Um, and then anecdotally, you know, I, I travel around and visit these courts and talk to participants or graduates from these programs. And what I hear is that had they not had access to this program, they don't know where they would be and that, that these programs are truly saving their lives. And then I hear from their family members that are so thankful that they, that, that their loved one had access to a program like this and could get help with sometimes long-standing underlying issues um, that they just haven't ever been able to tackle. Um, and then there's a direct connect with our foster care system. Um, I, I have visited um, some courts that have, have looked at the data of people that are coming through the problem-solving courts and whether or not they've been involved in the foster care system, and that number is very, very high. Um, so what that tells me is that we need to do a better job collecting that data and looking at the connection and then um, really improving what we're doing on the front end um, with, with kids that are entering the foster care system. The, the goal of, of our foster care system is reunification. Um, so we want to keep kids safe while we're helping um, parents deal with their issues and, and get the help that they need so that we can reu reuni reunify families when it's possible. If it's not, we want kids to be safe and to be placed in, in homes uh, where they're loved and, and their needs are met. And, and hopefully be adopted. Thanks. Yeah, that I, um, I'm perhaps most excited about that role um, and, and the opportunity to work on those issues. Like I said, I had uh, a fair amount of involvement on the other side of the bench as being um, an attorney and working with the various sections of the state bar, interacting with the courts, uh, with the, the, the judges, and, and trying to you know, implement some of those systems. Um, so I'm very excited for the opportunity to do that. I think that there's a lot of um, a lot of opportunity to really listen um, to what the public wants and what the public needs. Uh, listen to what you know how we can support um, the lower courts, the trial courts, to make sure that they have the resources and the support that they need to actually implement some of these. I always say that I think one of the important things is to, to know what you don't know and be able to be willing to listen to those who do. You know, there are so many people in various aspects, like, like Justice Clement was talking about, various aspects of the system who know really, really well what works and what doesn't work and where the problems are. Uh, and so I think that that's a, a, a big function that I'm looking forward to, of being able to sit and listen and to some of those stakeholders and then 
help, help them implement some, some improvements. And we're excited to have her help. We have a long list of things we're keeping yes. for her. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've already gotten started to get yeah. the list. I was very excited to get it. There's a lot to do. Yeah, Justice Kevin, I was telling me before you got here that she was had a big pile of papers that she was reading <laughs> and, and all her homework that she was doing over the holidays uh, yeah. to get ready for the big day. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about your decision to run uh, for the Supreme Court, because that's an elected uh, position. Um, Justice Kavanaugh, uh, your father was on the Supreme Court in Michigan, uh, which I would imagine would have some impact on that, uh, on that decision. Was that a part of how you weighed that decision? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I have um, literally spent my whole life somehow involved with the Supreme Court. Uh, he was first elected, I think, when I was 11 years old. Uh, and then, um, so that was obviously a big part of our life, and so I had a, a <coughs> sort of a, a, you know, a great view of how important the court was, um, how uh, much uh, respect and trust is placed in who the justices are, um, and really an attitude uh, or a, an understanding that, that justices are really are public servants. That was something that my father stressed, still stresses. Um, so I, I grew up with that, and then, like I said, I spent my career practicing in those appellate courts, uh, and so it sort of seemed that was the natural progression is to you know, to run for the court um, because because I really do think, like I was saying, there's so many important things that can be done, and you can have such a critical uh, role in um, in making the justice system work for everyone and access to justice, and, and um, so. So it, yeah, it did. I do have to, I always say this, my father was actually one who strongly encouraged me not to go to law school because we have <laughs> a lot of lawyers in our family and he said that we needed, you know, people who could actually fix things and, you know, like plumbers <laughs> and electricians and things. So, but despite his, his advice, I did go to law school. <laughs> Justice McCormick, I'm interested a little bit in your background as a, a clinical teacher and also someone who worked in legal aid uh, mm -hmm. in New York. Um, I know you have been deeply involved in access to justice. Yeah. And I'm wondering how uh, that has impacted your work and if you've been able to continue that work on the court. Well, and, yeah, in fact, I think, again, the, the, the idea that the court has this administrative role gives us um, a, a lot of opportunity to figure out how we can make sure the, the, the justice system is working for, for, for more people more of the time. And so I've been um, excited to be able to work on a lot of uh, issues that I consider access to justice issues since I've been there, um, including, of course, um, My Legal Help, which I think is a fantastic resource for self-represented litigants, and trying to be mindful of uh, a, a, as we um, uh, improve technological ways for people to interact with the courts, mm -hmm. How, the, how, those, how those things do not leave out people who um, traditionally don't have as much access to technology, um, mm -hmm. and there are, there are a million other examples. But yeah, I started out as a legal aid lawyer. Um, that was my very first job out of law school, and um, the, the uh, Legal Aid Society is, uh, it, it has a, a very special place in my heart, um, and, I, and, I, and I know that uh, the, this court has the opportunity to, to make sure we can expand access to justice, and I'm uh, delighted that I have um, so many colleagues that feel the same way, uh, especially the, the two sitting next to me. I'm actually teaching a class, though, this winter at the University of Michigan Law School with a computer scientist on um, access to justice. It's a problem-solving lab, and we are going to basically put uh, a bunch of University of Michigan, smart University of Michigan students, not just law students, but also information system students and public policy students, and put them to work on some like crazy ideas I have for uh, increasing access. Because um, you know, when you can put like 20 more people on your crazy ideas, you get more done. So, so I thought, ah, I could just teach a class and get a computer scientist to do it with me. And, yeah. So I have some I, even more fun to be had in this area, I believe, in the years to come. So. That's exciting. Yeah. I look forward to seeing how yeah, that yeah. plays out. Bob Gillette, I roped in as one of my experts, so you know from legal aid circles. So right, it's going to be great. Yeah, yeah, and I think we're doing a lot of work in legal aid about trying to figure out how we bring people in without um, without leaving those gaps of people who don't have other resources um, yep. and making it easier for some but not for all others. So to make it uh, more inclusive. Yeah, it's an important moment as we move to statewide e filing and all of these uh, really important. I think. Um, technological shortcuts for people to it, get their business done with courts. It, they're, they're, it's important that we have these, but we got to make sure we don't leave out a whole class of people as we as we as we go there. So, that's right. Well, thank you all. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and we'll come back and talk about the elections in just a moment. Nothing hurts my mom that she showed anyway. She'd always say, "You do what you need to do to take care of yourself," but she thought that meant. She had to do it on her own. 
we were trained to help others. But there's strength in finding help for yourself, too. We're in this together. Even the toughest of us might not know where to go to get a little support. Encourage women who have served to learn more about the VA care and benefits they've earned. The VA Women Veterans Call Center connects veterans with personalized information on VA services that can make a difference. Call 1-855-VA-WOMEN or visit www.womenshealth.va.gov. The right to play on any playing field, you have earned it. The right to hold a job, you have earned it. The right to study in any school, you have earned it. The days of separation and segregation are over. Welcome back to Legally Speaking. I'm here today with the three justices of the Michigan Supreme Court. And we're here today talking about the impact of women's success in the 2018 election. I'd like to turn our conversation uh, to the election, Justice Clement. Um, you were nominated by the Republican Party um, and uh, didn't get full support from the party during that campaign. That campaign. Um, and it's my understanding that that was based on some decisions that you made um, in the court, um, specifically your decision on putting the proposal to uh, the anti-gerrymandering proposal on the ballot and also a decision about gun control in schools, allowing Ann Arbor and Cleo schools to restrict guns in their school districts. When you made those decisions, did you think that was gonna have an impact on your campaign? Um, and did it play out the way that you, you thought it would? Um, I, I knew that it, that it very well could have an impact. Um, and you know, it, it didn't, didn't play into my decision making at all. Um, as I said, from the, the day that I was appointed to the court, um, I was going to be a justice that was independent, impartial, and fair, and that I was going to apply the law as as I believed that it was it was written and and what the words of the law say. Um, and so that's what I did in, in both of those cases. Um, you know, without going into a lot of a lot of detail on on either one of them, um, you know. I, I can say that af the day after um, those opinions came out, I immediately, you know, I, I heard pushback um, and that it would impact uh, the election. Um, and I, I heard it before as well, while we were um, deliberating on cases. Um, I think that highlights some of the difficulty and some of the issues that we have with the election process with judges. Um, but I, I said while I was deliberating on those cases and while I was campaigning, that I was going to do my job um, the way that I believe uh, judges should do their job, and I was prepared to lose the election um, um, to, to, to do my job the right way. Is that something that you feel on a regular basis on the court? Uh, maybe Justice McCormick, you can talk to that, that pressure from um, outside influences to, to vote in or make a decision in a certain way? I mean, there's a lot of data on um, the way judicial elections, you know, undermine the independence of the branch. So, you know, it would be silly for me to say, no, it hardly ever happens. This was unusual. Um, it's not unusual. I mean, unfortunately, when people um, vote for judges and justices are nominated by political parties, it sends, in my view, the wrong message um, about the judiciary, which really is 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 different from the partisan branches of government right in the other branches of government if you don't like the policies of the 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 executive you vote them out to get different policies and the thing with with judges is you you vote for us even though we may well rule against you tomorrow you know you're really voting for us to be this different actor in a constitutional democracy um, and one of our colleagues said to me when i was first on the bench and he had actually david viviano had, had been elected before he said yeah you you, you, in an early decision where I was getting some pushback from people who thought like, well, we, wait, we voted for you. How can you, how can you, how can you vote that way on that case? And he said, yeah, you have to be willing to lose friends and lose elections if you're going to do this job the right way. Um, and you know, just in, no, nobody's a better model for that than, than Justice Clement, I have to say. Um, and it's one of the reasons I'm proud to serve with her. Thanks. 
So let's talk a little bit about the bigger, the bigger part of the elections. Um, as I started our discussion, this uh, the election in 2018 uh, had a huge impact of women's success in, in Michigan. Uh, the top three executive positions, three of the seven justices on the Michigan Supreme Court will now be women. Um, how will this change the way government functions and will it have any impact on an ordinary Michigander? Well, I mean, I, I, um, I think it, it's always the case that, you know, that if you have a more diverse group at the table making decisions, you get different decisions. You get different perspectives. You get better decisions. Um, and so, you know, I, I always laugh that, that I heard somewhere uh, during the campaign season where somebody said, well, I think people are, are you know, maybe ready for women to serve in positions of power and somebody said well I don't care if they're ready or not because they're coming <laughs> you know I mean because we're going to do it um, so it, it does seem on one hand yes um, you know it was it was a historic election and that but um, it also seems sort of like I can't believe that it's historic that that you know just because we had uh, you know women at the at the all levels of, of government that were elected it, it should be um, sort of unremarkable. It should be, in my opinion. Um, but, um, but I think also uh, not just because uh, I don't think that the, the candidates, and I, I hope that I think that that's true of both Justice Clement and myself, that, um, that we weren't elected just because we were women, but because of, of who we are and the, and the, the um, you know, the, the positions that we held, the experience that we have, the leadership that we wanted um, to demonstrate. And I think, um, you know, the gender is pr probably the, the least remarkable thing about us, mm -hmm. right? So as a, um, a mother of two myself and uh, somebody who has a demanding career, I am asked on a regular basis about work-life balance, how I manage to keep those two a very full professional life and a full personal life in balance. Um, and I think it's a really important question that we should all be thinking about. Um, but I don't think it's just a question for women. Um, and I'm wondering your thoughts on what has to happen in our society uh, to the point where we're not remarking on women taking over uh, uh, positions in politics and we're asking everybody uh, the question about work-life balance. So it's not a woman question, but a person question. What do you think has to happen? So I've been asked my entire career, I, I'm a mom of four, um, I've been asked my entire career how, how I have four children and am able to to do my career. Um, no one has ever asked my husband that question, ever. And he does, uh, he, he's a, an attorney as well. He works incredibly hard, um, both professionally and with our children. Um, and it, nobody's ever asked him that. Um, I also got asked a lot on the campaign trail if my daughters were proud of me. I've got two girls and two huh. boys. Um, and my response was all four, all four of my children are proud of me. Um, you know, I think that we, we're already seeing a change in, in younger people where it's, you know, w women being in, in leadership roles are, that it's, it's, it's awesome, it's exciting, but it's not something that they look at as, as special. It's just, you know, they, they're voting for the person. They're voting for a woman because they think she's the best qualified or they're voting for a man because they think he's best qualified. Um, so I think the younger generation is already turning that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think having women in, in leadership roles can help with, with the older generations to, to realize that this is, this is about people you know, that, that have careers, that have families, that are trying to, to, to do their best to lead and to do their job well and also um, you know, raise their families or, or you know, spend time with, with aging parents. And everyone is, is trying to find that balance and it's not a, it's not a gender thing any longer. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to us being able to help all those men out there who need our help in <laughs> figuring out how to you know, spend more time with their kids and, and their aging parents. You know, well, with more of us at the table, we're gonna, we're gonna make things better for them, I promise. Right, right, and sharing that insight, I think it's helpful mm -hmm. because I think you're right that the, there's men out there who are making have that same struggle, mm -hmm. but it's not Absolutely. a conversation that we're having on yeah. a regular basis. Right. I do have to say, I think it's a bit of a misnomer to call it a balance because I have, when I'm able to sort of keep all those balls, I have, I have two daughters as well, um, and it, I, I don't feel like I'm balanced. I feel like <laughs> I have just sort of squeaked it out, you know, where where um, you know no no 
ball got dropped, no kid got left somewhere, <laughs> no, every game was made, you know, those sort of things. But it doesn't feel very balanced to me, sounds a little bit more um, serene and ideal than how I feel it actually works in, in reality. I heard it described as like the four burners, you know, you can't have all four burners on at any one time. So there are many a days where I walk in or at the end of the day be like, you know, I was a pretty good lawyer today. <laughs> I was a pretty good mom today. I wasn't a great housekeeper. I wasn't a great cook, but that's okay, you know. Uh, and that will that that being good at one or the other shifts, you know, daily. But I like the idea of over the course of your lifetime, you know, bigger picture because it, it can be hard to look at the bigger picture because yeah. you're in the you know this day or this afternoon or this week or whatever it may be. Yeah, phones are um, very helpful. Yeah, so that you can get a text. You know, there were plenty of text messages that my husband and I got together yeah. is one of you picking us up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah probably one. <laughs> and then yeah. we went direct with each other, are you? <laughs> I wasn't, no, I'm not in town. We got it, yeah. But only one child was forgotten and it was very close to home. <laughs> and, and there were other kids there and they, they were able to get it right home. So. I feel like it takes a village. That's, yes. that's saying so it holds true that yeah. sometimes you have to call that neighbor or yeah. Uh, your friend to go a lot take your times. kid that you've yeah. oh, in my case a lot of times yeah. yeah and I think that and it's a it's a good experience of, of you know that you have to ask for help yeah. at times and rely on other people and you know then you are that much more appreciative of how fortunate you are that you have people to help so okay well thank you all so much for being here today uh, and thanks for joining us on Legally Speaking